well? Do you get bored into a relationship easily? Sometimes. <laughs> I've also noticed, and I've never seen this in the literature anywhere, and maybe it's just one of those you find when you look for it, but I've noticed there seems to be more than random chance men with ADHD and women with borderline personality disorder. Which makes sense because there's never a dull moment if you're <laughs> so, so it's a good combination. Plus, the, board, the person with borderline personality never wants to admit to doing anything wrong. And the guy with ADHD, unfortunately, has had a lot of experience of being the guy who did something wrong, even if he didn't, but let's play it on him anyway. So it's kind of, it's, it's an interesting combination. Not fun, I don't think, but um, again, the last key concept here for working memory is write things down rather than try to keep it all in your head. So keeping a, a written schedule rather than keeping it in your head, writing out, you know, kids writing math problems, they don't like to write it out. Um, but other things also, just in general, like, you know, packing list, having it written down, a shopping list, having it written down. So rather than trying to keep it here and counting on your working memory, okay, at the store I need to buy da 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 At the store I need to buy da 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 the store, what was I buying again? You know, so having some sort of written thing rather than keeping it in our head. <clears throat> Something about that also, I mean, if you can add on to that, that you might, not for the store example, but to-do lists, mm -hmm. they become huge. And then there's a matter of priority. Right. You said a little bit about that, how you help in choosing priorities. Right. And, that, and that's a good question. I think that <coughs> these are related. Giant to-do lists sometimes reflect not having clear priorities. Because it's your priorities that tell you what's worth doing and what's not worth doing. Because just because you put something on a to-do list doesn't mean it needs to stay on there until it gets completed. There's some, you know, life evolves and the things change over the course of a day or a week, and what originally was a good thing on your to-do list may no longer be worthwhile. So there's some things that you just gotta check them off or cross them off even though you didn't do it. Um, because otherwise it does, it becomes so big that it, it doesn't work anymore because the important things get lost in the middle of all of this other stuff. So setting priorities involves a certain amount of working memory as well, because you need to be able to step back, think about the bigger picture, think about all the different moving parts and all the different things and competing demands in your life, and abstract out the most important, what's most important, what's a little less important, less important, less important. So. Um, it creates a situation that there's a lot going on. So, so on the one hand, writing some of this stuff out can be helpful. Again, put it on paper rather than in your head, or on a computer screen rather than in your head, to really look at what is everything going on and what is the most important, but to pause and really take a look at it and not simply react to everything that's going on. Because all of us in life have everything going on and everything is pulling, but just because it's pulling doesn't mean it's really important. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that's an important thing. And actually, when we, maybe when we get to hindsight and forethought, we'll talk about this even more, of how do you decide what's the most important. We set priorities based on, you know, the past and the future as well as what's going on in the present. So I just want to add to that, so at the moment that someone's making a list, would it be a good idea at that same moment to prioritize it with numbers? Like, because I know someone's will do that where I'll say, first, like, the most important thing on this list of five things is one, two. If I don't get to five, at least I'll go to right. three. So is that like a suggestion? Yeah. That it would be a good idea at the same moment to prioritize it. And that would be something to put right on the list. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right at that moment. Yeah. So, and to be willing to cross things off when they're not going to get done, mm -hmm. you know. So that's often something that I tell my clients because often they don't feel like they are allowed to do that or something. So, um, now I have at the end here, I have um, at the end of the handouts, for each of these key concepts, I have a slide of four different strategies, so specific strategies. Not in the sense that these are all of the strategies, but hopefully this is a good example so you can understand the concept a little better and then create your own strategies. Page 29. Page 29. So, just because I don't have time to cover them all here, so, but I wanted you to have them so at least 
to have them. In this under sense of time, the key concepts are supplement your internal sense of time with plenty of clocks and external reminders. It's hard, it's hard to manage time well if you don't know what time it is. I have three clocks in my office. Well, I have three that you can see from where you're sitting. <laughs> I can actually see the clock behind me reflected in the paint, in the glass, and the, you know, painting hanging up over there totally by accident and it's in reverse but I can tell when the minute hand is coming up on 50. So I can I always know what time it is in my office because how can I run on time if I don't and I don't want to do this. Oh very interesting. <laughs> Go on. So yeah, an example of this is wearing an actual watch. I don't wear an actual watch, but that's because I tend to spend most of my time at work where I have clocks. But, um, but wearing a watch rather than using your cell phone, because if all you have to do to check the time is this, you're much more likely to, to see it. If you have to pull something out of your pocket and press a button and go, oh, that's what time it is, you're less likely to do it. So those in the room who have a watch get a little gold star today. Um, <clears throat> You know, second key concept here is using alarms or other limits to notify you that a specific time has arrived. We kind of talked a lot about that one because it's a big one. Um, and then using a schedule to plan out your time. It's amazing to me how many clients I have who don't have anything of a written schedule. They kind of take things as they come, which often puts them at the wrong place at the wrong time. Perspective memory. Now, in this case, all the others have three key concepts. In this case, I can only come up with two. Partially, and this is my excuse, is that perspective memory is based on working memory and sense of time. So, in the case of things that are only remembered for a short amount of time, so some seconds or a minute or two, maybe, it's more about working memory. Whereas things that need to be remembered over a longer period of time, it's more about the sense of time that kicks in. So like, when I get to the office tomorrow, I have to remember to find that book. That's more an example of sense of time, or that's based more on the sense of time than it is on working memory. Because I'm not sitting here from this moment until tomorrow saying, get the book, get the book, get the book, get the book, get the book. Does that make sense? Um, so the key concept here, the first one is support your working memory by using external reminders to keep the task in your awareness. We've talked about some examples of that. Then, on the other side of it, support your sense of time by setting up reminders and alarms that will trigger your memory at the right time and place. So, for example, if I have something at home that needs to come to work with me, I put it on top of my bag that I use to go back and forth. Because I always take my bag, I don't have to think about it, and if it's sitting on top of my bag, or better yet, in my bag, I don't need to use it here to remember because it's right here. So what are some other examples of things that people do? Yeah? If I'm with a car, wherever I am, if I don't want to lose something or forget it, I just put it through the car key. So there's no yeah. way I can take the car key and not take one. Right. And that's exactly, so you're tying, you're connecting the new thing with the established habit, which is a great thing to do. It's like, you take, you know, you put the pill bottle next to the coffee maker because you always go to the coffee maker or next to the toothbrush or next to whatever, so it's always right there. Where the example that you gave of the post-it note and putting it on the, on the door, that's the place to remember, not somewhere else. Because you're definitely going out the door, that's the place to remember and take your umbrella, it's going to rain today. Or something. <laughs> Emotional self-control. Um, the first key concept here is involved in managing stress, because the more stressed out we are, anybody, the more emotionally reactive we tend to be. So some of this is stuff like exercise, it's having time to relax, it's some of the, um, you know, just dealing with some of the psychological fallout, so like not being defensive, that every little thing that happens you get really defensive about it because You've had too many experiences where things don't work out, so that creates a more stressful environment because you're always on edge, waiting for the next bad situation to come up. Um, the second emotional self-control key concept is the less strongly you feel an emotion, the easier it is to control it. And this may be a place where the mindfulness training comes in. 
to be able to train yourself to take the emotion and bring it down, to kind of see beyond the emotion, to feel the emotion without allowing it to kind of run what you do. What are some other examples? Like what else do people do that's helpful here? I have noticed in my practice, I work with kinesiology, so it's not a psychological therapy, uh, that once you change the stimuli that the body sends to the brain about the situation, it changes your outlook on the situation and therefore your behavior. So it doesn't necessarily have to come through the brain, it can come through the body as well. Right. Yeah, and certainly, you know, a lot of the relaxation training, for example, breathing, breathing you know, muscle relaxation, um, that that, as much as what we're thinking drives what our body is doing, it also goes the other way. The change in what our body is doing feeds up to our thinking or our feeling. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the final one here is own up to your reactions. That it's not what happens in that one moment that determines what happens ultimately, but that there's a chance to kind of clean it up. So if someone has a strong initial reaction to then resolve to address it after, right afterwards and say, you know what, I know this is what I said, but this is really what I meant, or I know it came out like that, but here's really what I was trying to say. Um, and to sort of to own the reaction. But that's much easier said than done. And when we talk about therapy, we're going to talk more about that. Because to own up to the reaction means you have to be able to admit to it. And you have to be able to be okay about it. And that's, easy, that's not easy to do, but it's definitely important. Because if you don't own up to it, at least with yourself, you can't have any control over it. Um, so two more here. Self-activation, key concept. First, make the first step smaller and more manageable. So um, if the whole big project feels too big, if you can shrink it down to something that feels more manageable, you're more likely to get yourself going on it. So something big and messy like, um, I don't know, preparing your taxes. It's a big, awful thing. So to say, all right, you know what? All I'm doing today is I'm just finding all the papers, or at least most of them. So I'm going to go around, I'm going to gather up this here and this here, and I'm just going to put them all together so they're all in one place. That's all I need to do today. And then the next day, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take it, I'm just going to kind of sort them out generally. These are this, and these are this, and on this pile is those, and that's all I'm doing. I'm not adding anything, I'm not researching anything, I'm just sorting it out. So, or whatever, to find a way to break it down, break it down, break it down, so that first step feels more doable, so there's less of that resistance to doing it that then creates a situation where then it all gets done in a panic at the end, which is, of course, what we want to avoid. <coughs> Second key concept here is visualize the rewards for starting or finishing something. So it's, often what happens is when we have to do something, we look at the price paid, Look, this is really boring to do. I don't want to do this. And not think as much about, but here's the reward. If I do it, here's the good thing that comes of it. So to really visualize the rewards, to think about the rewards so it's easier for the person to get themselves going. You know, if you organize your desk, how good would that be? How good would that feel to be able to find stuff right away? Get rid of all the extra junk. You only find what you need. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, it would be. Let me think about it as I'm doing this boring thing of, of throwing things away and organizing. And then finally, work on a task even if you don't feel motivated. I hate to say it, sometimes you just got to do the boring stuff. I wish that wasn't true, but sometimes you do. So, not fight it, not make it into a moral issue, not whatever. It's just, all right, I just got to do this. I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to get it done, and on to better things. So not waste a lot of time sort of being upset about it. Last slide here in terms of these. So um, hindsight and forethought key concepts. First is intentionally pause before reacting and then consider your options. So to try to build in that habit of I'm going to pause, I'm going to think, I'm going to see what's going on. And perhaps to make a point of doing a regular check-in with yourself. For teaching clients how to do a regular check-in. So first thing in the morning, here's what I'm going to see. I'm going to 
look at my priority list, maybe you have it written down, and I'll look at my to-do list, I'm gonna check my email real quick, check my voicemail, see what's there, and then I'm gonna make some decisions about what it is that I'm gonna do, rather than just simply reacting to everything that's going on around you in the moment. Um, make a point of seeing how you're doing occasionally and then adjust as necessary. So not getting lost in the middle of something, setting an alarm when you're surfing the internet, so you can say, it's been half an hour, do I keep doing this, do I go do something else? But finding a way to kind of create a pause so that you can stop and think about what you're doing. And then finally, reflect upon lessons learned after something has happened. These are places that coaches and therapists can be very effective. So can friends and romantic partners. How's your day? What's going on? How was your week? What do you got coming up this week? Let's talk about it. So engage that wisdom and engage that process of thinking forward of what needs to be done when. You know, oh, I can do that on Thursday. Oh, wait a second, I can't do it on Thursday. My kid has a, a musical or something on Thursday. I'm not gonna be here on Thursday night. Damn, I have to do it on Wednesday. Okay, good thing we talked about it. You know, something like that. So, a lot of what we do in therapy is this stuff. You know, whether we think about it or not is this, this is a lot of what we're doing. Um, so this executive function strategies, does that kind of make sense? You kind of see that progression of how the executive functioning weaknesses cause certain outcomes which we don't like, and then the strategies are based on the executive function weaknesses, hopefully they create outcomes that we do want. Like hopefully that kind of thread runs through that. Um, I have here then, you know, what I call coaching with lists of strategies. And this is more used by, like I said, the folks who don't have a, a sophisticated understanding of ADHD or human functioning or whatever, and they just, they have a lot of good ideas, but a good idea for the wrong person is not a helpful idea. Or a good idea for the wrong situation is not a helpful idea. So, um, the good news though is it's nice to have a bunch of strategies so you got something to pick from. So you read a list of strategies so when a client comes in you say, oh, you know what, actually I think I know something that might work. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel with them. In my integrative treatment book, I have a bunch of lists of strategies as well as all my other books. Um, I also have PDFs available on my website, adultadhdbook.com, there's places on the web and otherwise that you can get some of these good ideas. But, you know, here's copies of the books. Um, generally, though, my sort of um, philosophy on coaching is work the process and the product will follow. So it's less about, you did this one time, what happened? But it's more about focus on the process you're using or focus on the process your clients are using. Give them a better process of if you generally do these kinds of things, generally these kind of outcomes will occur. In that way, one or two failures or one or two setbacks don't throw the whole thing off the tracks. That, you know, you focus on the process, you do it, if you get off, you get back on, you work it again, and then hopefully you get a better outcome in the end. So that's coaching. Let's take a five minute break, and then we'll do psychotherapy. What's the difference between coaching and therapy? Because a lot of the coaching stuff sounds like sort of more CBT oriented therapy. And really it is. That that line between what's the difference of coaching and therapy is, I have to say, I have never figured out what that line is. And I think the reason is it's a pretty blurry line that separates the two. So it's really more a matter of coaches do coaching and therapists do therapy, I suppose. But a lot of what we do kind of overlaps in the middle. But talking about therapy with adults with ADHD, um, Right. 
Right. So it's yeah. more behavioral kind of. But in order to get to some of the behavior in terms of the coaching, you're also doing a certain amount of therapy, looking at thoughts and feelings and things like that. And then you'll see we also get into relationships and those dynamics. So, you know, people are complicated. And no one school of thought explains everything that goes on with people. But part of what we do as therapists is when a new client comes in with ADHD, um, or they're just being diagnosed perhaps by us, part of what we need to do is explain to them why past treatment didn't work out better, and why we have the possibility to offer them something better. Because we want to keep them involved in the therapy so that they can actually do something and make some of those important changes. I would said before that, you know, when I talk about therapy with adults with ADHD, I'm not really specific to any school of thought or any orientation. That you can take a lot of these ideas and adapt it into any approach that you might use. But you might need to, depending on how you approach it, you might need to make some changes in your work with adults with ADHD. So, one of the things that might show up in terms of transference feelings of a client with ADHD is that they may minimize the extent of the chaos and struggle, that they've worked really hard to show that they kind of got it together. They don't, but they want people to see that. So when they come in and talk to you, they may not be completely forthright about how bad things really are. So. The solution then is to offer an accepting attitude, to offer an attitude of like, don't worry, I've seen it all, kind of a thing. So that they're more comfortable telling you really what it is that's going on. They may fear uh, you know, disappointing you that if you give them homework that they're not going to complete it because other people have given them homework over the years, such as teachers or other therapists, and it didn't work out. So the solution there is to frame failures as learning opportunities. Not as an opportunity for judgment, but as a learning opportunity. All right, let's see what happened, you know? If, because whatever happened here with this homework assignment I gave, maybe we can learn something we can apply to the next situation, or we can apply to other <coughs> situations. And you frame it that way right from the beginning so that they don't skip the next session because they didn't do the homework. They may also, especially this is much more true of teens and young adults, but they may see you as yet another unreasonable authority figure telling them what to do. So the solution here is you need to back off, that you can't care more than your client does about what happens. So explore with them about it, push them a little bit in the right kind of way, but to not get overly involved in what they do and how they do it, because that's when you become like their mom nagging them about homework. And that's not a fun dynamic for anybody involved. Now, on the other side, you know, in the other chair, talking about counter-transference feelings, our clients bring their ADHD with them everywhere they go, including in the therapy room. So part, then, of our job as therapists is to not allow our own reactions to that situation to color what we do with them. You know, so the client who, I don't know, I have, I'm just thinking of one example, but I can think of many. You know, a client who, whose husband, he hasn't paid taxes in three years. Now, for me, I'm like, oh my God, he hasn't paid his taxes in three years? Now, but I don't say that and I don't show it, but that's my own feeling that I have. And I take that feeling and I put it aside and then we talk about what's going on. So... In those kind of situations, it's better often, I think, to folk to start with either education or coaching before going to something, before doing something related to interpreting psychodynamic issues of what might be going on. So it's like we talked about, you know, passive aggressive or whatever. Um, and then, you know, part of that also, kind of like I was saying, kind of controlling your own obsessive compulsive tendencies to the extent that you have any, to not allow your clients to make you too anxious because when you're anxious, then things tend to not work out well. There's potentially ADHD brings several barriers to doing good therapeutic work. One of them involves missing appointments, that you schedule it. They agree, they think it's a good idea, but then somehow they miss the appointment. So 
So solutions here are, number one, to just discuss outright how appointments are going to be tracked. You give them a card, but then talk about where they write it down, what happens, um, do they put it in their phone, do they put it on their calendar, do they leave it in the car, like what actually happens with that piece of information. And to use that as, it's kind of like, this is as good an example as any to talk about how these things are done. So you could talk about other stuff they do, or other examples of this, or just talk about this, and enable that, and use that as the example. Um, to the extent that it's possible, if someone misses an appointment, I'll, I'll try to reschedule them within the week, if I can. Sometimes, though, I can't. If you miss on Thursday, I may not have anything this week. Uh, or you miss on Wednesday, and I'm just booked all the way through, all the rest of Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. So, you know, one of the things that I do, and I don't know if this is a standard practice here, but if someone misses an appointment or they cancel less than 24 hours notice, unless they're sick or something they couldn't control, I charge for the no-show. And that makes the appointment more important to them because they know they're going to pay for it. And that also causes me to be less resentful about the fact that they're, you know, messing up my scheduling. Um, it is kind of degrees to do it as well. Uh, but sometimes they might see this as a punishment. Especially. And then if they see it as a punishment, then it goes back so, like, to, I wasn't good, I'm being mm -hmm. punished. And then that may cause them to not come again. Right. And, and that's a good point, that it can be seen as a punishment. So it's all about how you frame it. And the way that I frame it is that if you cancel less than 24 hours or you just don't show up, I'm not able to offer that time to anybody else. So it puts me in a bad spot and it puts some of my other clients in a bad spot. So that's why I ask people to pay for it. And I try not to be angry about it, although sometimes I feel angry about it, but I try not to act on the anger. And I have some flexibility on it. I mean, there are times where I'm like, all right, whatever. That just is what it is. I have to catch up on emails anyway. It's because if you have flexibility, um, how do you apply that flexibility? So if somebody has a financial issue, you, you may be flexible as to not charge it without you need? Yeah, or, or if it's just a situation where I'm like, all right, you know, this is kind of an honest mistake. Fine, I'm just going to let it go. But next time. Right. And then often it's on the phone where I'm saying, hey, aren't we supposed to be meeting now? That's where I, that's the, often a place where we talk about, well, okay, so where did you, you know, let's talk about, you know, the new appointment, what are you going to do, where are you writing it down, da da da, and really, just, you know, like that's the moment that some of that gets discussed because now it means more. Because it's not just abstract, it's, it's right there. Um, Rather than missing appointments entirely, they may just simply come late. Mm -hmm. So they come 15 minutes late to a 50 minute appointment. Um, so, you know, to the extent that you can, discuss how to plan time better. Sometimes it's beyond their control and that just is unlucky. Um, other times it is, and those are the times you talk about either the coaching or some of the other things we talked about in terms of like assertiveness, of setting boundaries, of setting endings. So they leave here to get to there. In addition, I think it's also important for your own peace of mind to stick with a scheduled end time. So as much, you know, I'm not perfect at all, but I try to end at 50 minutes because I need that time to write a note, read the next note, check my voicemail, go to the bathroom, whatever, before my next client walks in on the hour. So to try, because if you know, if they know that you're ending there, it makes it more important to show up here. Clients might also miss important points, that you say something and boy is that a brilliant idea, and it doesn't stick because they don't, their attention goes somewhere else or they don't fully grab <laughs> everything that you're saying. So a couple suggestions, minimize the lengthy comments, you know, short and sweet, it's a good idea for kids also, your own kids. Um, repeating certain things, summarize it at the end so that it, you kind of put their focus on the most important part of what you're saying. They may also understand what you're saying, agree with what you're saying, but then they don't implement it. So one thing is, you know, if clients ask, I'm happy to allow them to take notes while we talk, <coughs> or if we're talking about a lot of details about something, I'll we'll say, um, do you want a piece of paper? Do you want to write this down? And then if they do, then I give them a pad and paper and they write it down. 
because I would rather that they capture the idea rather than get you know focus on trying to remember what I'm saying and then missing the next thing that I'm saying. Uh, how are you? Sometimes they ask me to record a session. So the question is, recording a session. I've had clients record the session. I'm fine. I don't know if they actually listen to it, but if they want to, whatever. And then I just try to say, not say anything that will get me sued. <laughs> um, so taking notes and then discussing how they're going to do whatever the task is, when they're going to do it, what are the potential barriers, what might, in the sense of what might get in the way, what are some approaches they can use. So. And this is a little bit more, you know, certain CBT approaches will do a lot of this. You know, let's talk about the failure points ahead of time so that you have a strategy to compensate, um, so that you address it beforehand so they don't need to make it up in the moment. Because anytime we make things up in the moment, it tends not to work out as well. Some clients prefer action to talk. So just, okay, Doc, tell me what to do. Um, so to the extent that you can keep the discussion moving, Keep it interesting, keep it moving along, keep it focused on the things that are important. Some clients are also very good at, the charming ones are good at getting other people to do things for them. Hey, can you give me a, do me a favor, can you give me a reminder before next week's appointment? Sorry dude, I can't. I got like 40 people I'm seeing this week. I don't have a secretary, I can't call you. Um, so instead, talk with them about what can you do to get that done, or how can you do that for yourself rather than counting on somebody else to do it? The good news about being charming is it kind of works for you. The bad news is you can use it to the, to the detriment of doing some stuff yourself. And then for your impulsive clients who don't really like to do all that boring planning, um, they'll take an approach, ready, fire, maybe aim if I get to it. Um, so. In those cases, you want to talk about, first of all, what's the price paid for acting impulsively? And then, you know, as much as it's boring, how do you set things up ahead of time so it's more likely that the right outcome happens or the desired outcome happens? Hi. Mm -hmm. um, there, sometimes there's other things involved in being actually able to express yourself coherently, you know, because of the working memory. Um, and that comes up in our clients. They're not able to tell you or you're asking them, okay, let's think ahead. Mm -hmm. And that actual process is very tiring for them. And they're like, oh, therapy. it's too much work, you mm -hmm. know, to tell you or to explain to you. Right. And I tend to be more actively now, involved. Now, attention, please. The library is closing. You know, in those conversations, I tend to be more active in the sense of I'll make suggestions at the being mindful of not speaking too much for them, but to say well, what about this, or have you thought about that, or is this what you're trying to say, or I wonder about this possibility, so, to kind of help them move the conversation along. Now the risk is, I might say something that's not really what they're intending to say, and it might get us down a wrong path, but then my hope always is that they'll say, um, no, that's not really what I meant. And if someone, if I feel like someone is more assertive, I'll be freer to throw a lot of stuff out and say, no, 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 okay, yeah. And if someone is a little bit more kind of restrained, I'll match that and slow down a little bit. And I won't throw a lot of those ideas because I don't have the faith that they're going to say, no, that's not really what I meant, because they want to be polite. With clients that have that issue, sometimes, um I want to do for you because I, I might use other methods uh, like exercises or drawing or role playing or something that might get them to show their emotions somehow. Yeah, and certainly doing, you know, like you said, role playing or drawing or any, whatever it is. If it works, it works. I don't care. If it works, it works. So, um, yeah, I think the more ways you can get something done, the more likely you are to get it done and to be able to be helpful to your clients. So, um, some clients find following rules, it's either difficult, or it's uncomfortable, or it's uninteresting, it's boring, whatever. They don't like to follow the rules. On the one hand, 
empathize with them, especially the teenagers. And part of that is I'll sort of take the approach of saying, look, I know this stuff is really stupid and you shouldn't have to do it, but here's the problem. If you don't do it, then blah, 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 blah. So empathize and yet kind of work with them on, look, you just gotta get it done. Get it done, get these people off your back. And the more oppositional ones tend to respond well to that, because then you're not another person telling them what to do. Um, we talked about taking notes during session. I'm okay with taking notes during the week as well. Write down what went on and bring it in. Let's talk about it so that they don't forget. Oh yeah, what was that? Um, by the same token, I'll keep track of my notes. You know, here's what we talked about. So when they come in today, I can ask them, hey, um, didn't you have that big meeting with your boss on Tuesday? Like, what happened with that? So it isn't this thing where at the end they go, oh, I was supposed to tell you about the meeting with my boss. Or did I mention my, that meeting with my boss? So I will make a point of bringing that up to keep that continuity going from session to session. Um, setting treatment goals can be helpful. Not that you're limited by the treatment goals, but to try to get some sense of, okay, these are the things that we're talking about. These are the things that we're working with that we're working on in session. Um, what can often be helpful is taking the big long-term goal and breaking it into some smaller pieces. For you to be the one to provide some of that structuring of the big goal, so it's easier for them to kind of see the steps required to go from A to B to C to D. <clears throat> um, Although I, perhaps I haven't said it as directly yet, a lot of what we've talked about in terms of ADHD has been focused on what are the effects on self-esteem in terms of how a client sees himself and, you know, sees himself in general in terms of effectiveness, but also sees himself in relation to others. So it's often said, it's sometimes said, um, that, you know, ADHD is just an excuse. And there are some people who, who do indeed use ADHD as an excuse. As far as I'm concerned, it shouldn't be used as, as an excuse, but it certainly is a great explanation. So, in other words, an explanation, the difference between explanations and excuses is, explanations help us understand why something is happening. And with that understanding, we can then apply it to make a different outcome. As opposed to an excuse basically lowers expectations. The problem with excuses is, excuses are dependent on the other person. If you will excuse me and lower the standards, then we'll do okay here. And that's great as long as that's the only person you have to deal with. But eventually you have to deal with someone who's not interested in excuses. They're not willing to lower the standards, and then you don't have anything to work with. So that's where the explanations come. They give the person with ADHD or their family member or whoever better strategies, better tools to create a better situation and not have to rely on other people to be forgiving. Is that difference? Yeah. And that's an important one. <clears throat> as much as we've talked about a whole bunch of strategies and we've talked about medication, ultimately therapy is often an important piece of it as well because all those strategies don't mean anything if the clients don't use them. They don't use them in the first place and they don't practice them on a regular basis. So part of our job as therapists is getting our clients into an approach situation rather than an avoidance situation. So approach problems, address it, take responsibility, and then do what needs to be done to make their situation better. So a little bit of the right, a little bit of the right therapy then makes all these other pieces work a whole lot better also. So this is how they all kind of tie together. I've said that ADHD is at its worst before it's diagnosed. The good news is, once a diagnosis is made, once there's some greater understanding in place, it's much easier to know, or it can really be kind of a game-changing situation in how that person sees themselves, or how other people see that person. So the parents see a child, this romantic partner sees you know, their romantic partner with ADHD. Um, so, it offers that better explanation. It's not all of who someone is, but it's a part of who they are, and it's a part that affects some other parts. So it's a matter of getting to a point where, of seeing that this affects 
parts of my life, but it doesn't affect all of my life. It doesn't determine all of who I am, but it affects part of who I am. And in some ways, it's the difference between being ADHD versus having ADHD, at the risk of kind of getting caught up in the, you know, in the words of it. Um, there are definitely people, and I get these questions a lot at presentations, or I get emails of my son, daughter, husband, wife, sister, brother, mother, father, has ADHD, clear as day, and I try to get them to go to a doctor and they won't go, or I try to get them to take medication, they won't take it, or whatever. And that's a pretty common situation. And on the one hand, I can very much appreciate it, that if you feel like your life has been harder than it's had to be, um, if you've had a lot of people say a lot of, let's just say, not very nice things about you over the years, I understand why you're hesitant to have one more kind of thing against you, if you know what I mean. Um, so it's sort of a situation of, great, not only am I distractible and forgetful, but now I also have this ADHD thing. <laughs> and they don't see how this new thing explains all these other things. All this other stuff is really this. So, um, or it's sort of official proof. You know, beforehand I could get by on just pretending I was sort of like everyone else. I just have to work a little harder. Now I saw this psychologist and now I'm officially screwed up. There it is, I'm crazy. I've worked really hard to pretend I'm not crazy and now I just give it up, I'm crazy. Um, as a, as opposed to seeing it that, you know, labels don't change what's happening. Labels just change our understanding of what's happening. So, by saying this is ADHD, it doesn't change anything about you. You still are whoever you are, and your strengths are, and your weaknesses are, and whatever. But what the label does is it organizes your experience for us, and it helps us understand okay, if this is what's going on with you, then let's do this kind of stuff to help you do better in your life. In that accepting the diagnosis is a step towards better things, it's a step towards having more control over what happens in your life. And that's really what it is. It's having more control over what happens in your life. So you're running your life, not your ADHD running your life. Um, Self-esteem is not built by nice people saying nice things to you. That's good, and we should all hear more nice things. The problem with building <coughs> self-esteem simply on nice people saying nice things is you're gonna run into people who say not nice things. And it takes very few not nice things to take away a whole lot of those nice things. So instead, I think good self-esteem, solid self-esteem comes from experience, from having good experiences where you try something, you work at it, you struggle at first, but then you do good at it, or you do better at it. Or feeling good about these parts of yourself so you can accept those parts of yourself. And it's that process of experiences and going from, I did this little thing to now I'm trying this bigger thing, and now I'm trying the next bigger thing. And that progression, that is what builds good self-esteem. How often do you see regression? Because I see that very often. I see clients of mine doing good things and feeling very good about themselves for a short term of time, maybe one, two, three, six months if we're lucky. And then for another six months or even more, it's disappointment. And then you go almost back to where they started. And I, I admit that as a therapist, I feel disappointed too. And most of the time I try not to show it, but it's not always easy. And then I get trapped in that mother role to just say, well, yeah. I expect more from you than you do from you. Yeah. Um, but is it often that you see this regression happening? Yeah, I mean, it's not an uncommon thing. It's that the things do better in the beginning because it's new and it's interesting. And then it's not new and it's no longer interesting. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah, it's that consistency. That's the hard part. So they fall back to what they're used to. And I think that the way that you prevent it is you talk about some of it ahead of time. It's to say, you know, look, this is good because it's new, but it's going to get boring. So maybe what we need to do is just keep coming up with some new strategies or circulate around, try this for a while, then you try that, then you try that, then you come back to this, or you mix it up, 
and to keep it new and interesting so that they are continuing to apply themselves fully to it. <clears throat> you know, like we talked about earlier, that you know, change what you can, accept the rest. Improving functioning is indeed important, but so is accepting the rest of it, because there will always be some remaining weaknesses, or some remaining struggles, or remaining aspects about themselves that they wish were different. So it's not a passive resignation of, well, I'm bad at getting my bills paid on time. Oh, well, what are you going to do? It's not that. It's saying, you know what? It's hard for me to get my bills paid on time. I'm going to work at it. I'm going to try to set some things up differently. But every now and then, pff, one's going to slip through. All right. You deal with it. You call the company and you pay by credit card. Okay, it's done. Let's move on. And not getting stuck in that, oh, there it is again. I always mess it up. It's not going to get better. Waste of time. It's easy to go there. But, yeah, okay. I, you know, this bill is late, but you know what? It's been four months since I had a bill late. That's like the best I've done ever. So one late bill, fine. Pay it, go on. And that's an important mindset to have. So, um, you know, just sort of find that balance between the two. Uh, holding ourselves accountable to say, you know what? I'm better than this, or I could do better, or I should do better, while at the same time, you know, not being so hard on ourselves that, you know, we just kind of give up, or that our clients just give up. One of the, when it comes to the social aspect of ADHD, um, we look at people's actions and in, infer their intentions. If you say you're going to do something and you do it, that tells me that thing was important to you. Or at least I'm important to you. Maybe you don't care about that, but you care about my feelings. If you say you're going to do something and you don't do it, it's easy for me to infer, well, either that wasn't important to you or I'm not important to you. Especially if this has happened 10 or 20 times over the last year. So it's important for folks with ADHD to separate the act the action from the intention. So allow them to see, so when their actions and intentions don't line up, for them to see, I know this is what my actions say, but really this is what I meant. This is who I am, this is how I see myself. So first to be clear within themselves, then to be clear with other people. I know I forgot it, I know that it looks like this, but you know what, it is important to me, you are important to me, but this is just how it worked out. But then when it comes to a child with they teach, you have to teach them how important actions are. If you're just, okay, because mm -hmm. my son tells me that all the time. I know I did this wrong. What I really meant was this, which is great if I accept it, then I have to teach him somehow mm -hmm. that his actions are equally as important. Because in the real life, yeah. mom will not be there all the time saying, yeah. oh, it's okay. And that's absolutely true. And that's the balancing act where you can't be too hard on him because that's not fair. But you also can say, well, as long as you meant well. Because nobody, only mom is going to say, well, as long as you meant well. Uh, and we're going to talk about um, apologies and making amends and fixing things. That's an important skill for everybody, but especially for some people. So um, I think it's important as well for, to help our clients recognize the successes that they have had in how important they are. Not in a simplistic, like, oh, you managed to get your clothes on all by yourself? Wow, that's great. Good boy. Not, not in a condescending <coughs> way, but to help our clients realize that, you know what? Certain things take more work and more dedication for you than they do for some other people. That is a good sign. That tells me something good about you. You're willing to work hard. You're able to get it done. You know, so helping them see the positive side of it and not just the negative side. It took me a whole other year to finish college. That means I'm stupid. No, it took you an extra year. You're willing to work a whole extra year to get your degree. Awesome. That's great that you did it. A lot of people don't do it. You did it. That's the good news. So you're not making things up. You're <coughs> taking what's there and you're reframing the experience and what it means. 
Um, because setbacks are a normal <coughs> part of life, I think it's important to have that resilience. And I think, you know, we've talked about this before that with some of our clients, because they have more of those experiences of things not working out as well as they would like, it's easy for them to hit a couple roadblocks and then give up. And I understand why, I totally get it, but our challenge here is to keep them going, to try the next and try the next, because that's how big successes are built, by little, little steps along the way. Um, is anybody familiar with acceptance and commitment therapy? I don't know how big that is over here. It's one of the kind of like third wave of CBT, I think it's called. So it's, there's a lot of mindfulness sort of stuff built into it. It's kind of related to DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. But it's, I really like the approach. The basic idea is acceptance means accepting certain discomfort, certain things being not the way we want them to be in order to be able to pursue the goals that we're committed to. So that's a commitment side. I'm committed to living this kind of a life or to living a life in line with these kinds of values. So in order to live that kind of life, I'm going to have to accept these certain things. So it's not being ruled by the things that make us anxious or the things that make us uncomfortable. So for example, a client who is I don't know, hesitant to date because things tend to not work out well for reasons they don't really know, or maybe they do know, but they can't change. So the acceptance, the commitment is, I'm committed to having a relationship. I want to be dating someone, I want to be married, I want to have kids, this is important to me. So the acceptance side of it is to accept that, you know what, sometimes it's not going to work out. Sometimes it's going to get messy, sometimes I'm going to get hurt. But that's okay, I accept that because my goal of having a good relationship is too big not to accept it. It's too important not to accept it. And I think that acceptance and commitment therapy is a great way of looking and working with folks with ADHD and other, and, you know, anxiety and depression and everything else too. Um, but let's talk about some maladaptive coping mechanisms that adults with ADHD often <coughs> find themselves using and then what are the strategies that we can use with our clients to help them kind of move beyond. So, the first is this concept called self-mistrust. I don't know who came up with this idea, but it's a great, it's a really insightful concept. So, the basic idea, self-mistrust is, if I say I'm going to do something, can I believe that I'm actually going to? Not do you believe me, but do I believe myself? <clears throat> or when I get to the end of the day and I think, I think I did everything. Can I believe that I actually did? Or is there a ticking time bomb? You know, there's that email I never send that I've completely forgotten about, and I'm going to get an angry phone call tomorrow. So it's that ability to trust that you've done what you need to do. Because of the inconsistency of ADHD, this self-mistrust is a common belief. So the solution here, and the solution is going to be similar for most of these, is a better informed treatment program hopefully improves their batting average. It makes them more consistent, more reliable, so when they say, you know what, I'll send you that, they can actually believe, you know what, I think I probably will. That's a likely thing that I'm going to send you that thing I said I'm going to send you. Um, We've talked about avoidance. You know, avoidance is a psychological um, behavior, something, concept. I don't know, it's the end of the day. <laughs> avoidance is something. Uh, so part of that is neurological, like we talked about in terms of self-activation, but some of it is also psychological because after things not working out well, it's easy to protect your self-esteem a little bit by not putting your heart into something. Okay, well, I'll just kind of I'll throw something together. I'll do it at the last minute because it's not an enjoyable experience. So the solution then in terms of working with our clients to do better on this is that hopefully not just some greater effort, so to not do half-hearted effort, but you know, really kind of put some good effort into it, but also better informed effort. So using some of these strategies that we've been talking about. Maybe a little bit of the right medication, maybe changing the dynamic in the relationship or in the family. 
maybe that will help the client indeed be more successful this time, or at least make it more likely that they'll be successful this time. Related to this is the idea, kind of coming from acceptance and commitment therapy, is feel the discomfort, but do it anyway. I know, I know you feel anxious about doing it. I know you feel uncomfortable, but you know what? Just do it. Feel it, put the feeling aside, and just do what you got to do. So not being run by our emotions, but being able to kind of put it aside when necessary. Another maladaptive coping mechanism here is the idea of acceptance of chaos. That after living a life that has, you know, it's kind of like it's always been like this, it's easy to feel like it always will be like this. This is my life, this is my fate. Hopefully, though, by actively working on reducing some of the chaos in their life, helping them with better strategies, helping them with the psychological avoidance, hopefully, then you open up the possibility that, you know what, maybe my future can be different. Maybe I don't have to keep living my life the way it's always been. It may not be perfect, obsessive, compulsive, like everything in its place, but maybe my life can be a little bit easier. And that's kind of a big revelation sometimes. Um, the next one, I think this is the last one. Um, so conflict avoidance. If you too often find yourself on the wrong side of a conflict, as in you're probably the one who messed something up, it's easy to get to a place where you avoid conflicts because who wants to be blamed for yet another thing? I mean, that totally makes sense to me. So, you know, part of this comes down to the neurology, the executive functions of not sort of pausing and seeing what exactly is going on. But some of it is there's the psychology of it, of, you know, the question of, did you call the doctor today? Because, you know, the answer is yes, which means, yes, I will now call the doctor <laughs> Hopefully. And it becomes a situation where the cover-up becomes worse than the crime, where they don't want to say, ah, oh, I forgot, because here comes a fight. So they say, oh, yeah, I did it, hoping that they can just do it tomorrow and then it's fine. Okay, good. Dodge that bullet. The problem is, if you get busted in that once or twice or four or ten times, then it, that becomes the problem. Did you call the doctor? Yes. Are you, well, what did he say? <laughs> what, okay, no. What, who is the name of the person who answered the phone? What's the receptionist's name there? And then you get this, that horrible situation where everything is like the Inquisition or a police interrogation. And nobody's having fun or winning in that scenario. So the solution then is, you know, on the one hand, to sort of really talk about and emphasize, it's better to disappoint someone earlier rather than later. And it's better to say, you know what? I screwed up. I didn't call. I promise I'll call tomorrow. Look, I'm putting a note in my phone. Then it is to say, yeah, I did it, and then get busted later. Now, part of that also involves working with the romantic partner to not freak out when they say, because here's the thing, if the romantic partner freaks out, where is the incentive to be honest? Mm -hmm. If you're going to get yelled at either way, take your chances, you know, because then maybe you won't get caught. As opposed to you guarantee you're going to get punished if you are on So there's a balance both ways. Like both people play their part in that situation. And then of course if you have some track record of actually doing of doing more things, you have more credibility to say, you know what? God damn it, I didn't do that, but I'll do it tomorrow. The other person is more likely to believe you because there are some things that you're doing. And they have less reason to be angry. Ironically, some adults with ADHD actually become kind of perfectionists, where they really try to do everything over the top. And the idea is, I might have messed that up, but if I do this perfectly, then I will make up for it. Or, it's one of those things where if something isn't quite finished, oh no, I'm still working on it, it's not ready yet. Until you actually hand it over to someone, there's no judgment. 
And if they do look at it and say, oh, I don't, you know, this over here. Oh, yeah, I know. You know, I was going to change that. I just, you know, I haven't gotten to that yet. So it's a way to kind of avoid the criticism in a way. Except the problem is perfectionism creates its own problems. So there are times when good and finished is better than perfect and unfinished. And sometimes you just have to take a chance. All right, here it is. It's not perfect. There are probably some things I would change. But you know what? It's done here. I'm going on to the next thing, either at work or at home or, or wherever it is. Um, Adults with ADHD are more likely to have trouble with either addiction or just overuse. So maybe they're not alcoholics, but they drink a little too much. Maybe they're not addicted to marijuana, but they smoke a little too much. Or, you know, other things like shopping is a good way to feel a little bit better about your life, you know, in the moment. Sex or pornography, you know, stimulation seeking. So, um, Part of that is the neurology, the difficulties with self-restraint in the face of temptation, difficulty with time management, seeking novelty, seeking thrills, um, turning out the lights. Uh, but part of it is also psychology. That you know, if here I am surfing the internet, looking at pornography, then I don't have to think about you know the fight I had with my wife, or what I need to do for work tomorrow, or whatever. So it's an avoidance and a self-medication. Unfortunately, of course, that <coughs> behavior tends to make the other stuff we're trying to help them with worse. So part of it is, you know, so the approach then is make their overall life better and more satisfying by addressing the ADHD, but you might also need to address the kind of more addictive thoughts or behaviors directly as well. So you don't just focus on the ADHD, you don't just focus on the addiction, you focus on both, because obviously they kind of come together. <clears throat> so, let's talk now, we talked about individual psychology, let's talk about relationships. Because obviously most of us exist within relationships of one kind or another. It's an easy thing that when you have someone with ADHD and someone without ADHD that you get this polarizing, where um, the person without ADHD becomes the responsible one, and the person without ADHD becomes the irresponsible one, or at least that's the myth in the family. Unfortunately, what happens is the person without ADHD, in an effort to control their anxiety of what's going on, becomes more and more controlling over the situation, and more and more critical and more and more dominating, which I understand from the perspective of they want to feel less anxious. But of course, nobody likes to be on the receiving end of that. So the person with ADHD then, understandably, rebels because nobody likes to be controlled and criticized all the time. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse. So part of what we're doing is often is not just working with a person with ADHD, but having their romantic partner come in even just for one or two sessions. Or you know, having the parent come in and not just with the child or teen, but you're working with as well in rebalancing a relationship, finding a way for them to approach things more productively for both people's benefit. It's not just about the non-ADHD person working to the benefit of the ADHD person because that can only last so long before they get tired of it, but finding a way where both of them can be happy about it. Um, we're lucky that at this point now there's actually three books written for the non-ADHD partner. And then, you know, here they are on the slide. So, um, they're all good. I think I actually, believe it or not, I think I actually have a, a blurb on every one of them. You know, the like things on the back or on the inside where it said, this is a great book, you should buy it. I think I actually wrote a thing for all three of them. So, I don't know what that tells you about me. Maybe, maybe either people like me or they think I'm a pushover and I write nice things. Um, but, a big part of ADHD in terms of the social piece of it is something called expectation management, which means um, it's basically reinterpreting ADHD behavior. So, you know, we talked about how we infer intentions from actions. So, if someone has trouble running late, it's easy for someone else to say, you know, obviously he thinks his time is more important than my time because if 
my time was important too, he wouldn't always run late like that. And that makes sense. I mean, I understand that logic. But if someone has ADHD, their actions don't reliably indicate what their intentions are. So in that case, they need to use their words to explain what their action, what their intentions are, because their actions will paint the wrong picture. So it's a matter, so in that case, it would be a matter of saying, you know, you don't have to say, I have ADHD and therefore I have trouble getting places on time. You might, but you don't have to use those words. But you could say, you know, I'm really bad at getting places on time, and I know I should be, and I'm really working on it, but it's always been a struggle for me. So so let's do this. Before you leave your house, call me and make sure I'm on my way. And that way, if I'm running late, then you don't leave early and get to the restaurant and then get bored and wonder what's going on. How about that? Is that, you know, let's, why don't we do it that way? So by explaining it like that, it, first of all, helps the other person not come to the wrong conclusions. This selfish jerk doesn't care about my time. But it also gives that other person permission to do something they otherwise wouldn't do. You know, that the other person might think, I don't want to call and see if she's left yet. I don't want to bug her. Like, that's not right. Um, but doesn't, sorry, doesn't that fall back to what you said before, though, that they have other people do their work for them? So now you call me and say, I'm coming. Should that be my responsibility? The call, well, perhaps it would be. If the person with ADHD is running late, then yeah, ideally they would call and not at the minute they're supposed to meet, but before and say, God, you're I'm running late. late, sorry. And that is absolutely true. But the other person is, everyone's responsible for their own happiness. So it's the person, it's not an ADHD person in that situation, is responsible for their own happiness as well. If they're going to be resentful sitting at the restaurant or whatever, it's to their benefit to call the person, the other person, and say, you're running on time, yes or no. Um, and I think that it's, you know, it's that whole thing of like, would you rather be right or happy? And some people take the rigid thing of saying, you know what? We said we're going to meet at 6. I shouldn't have to call. Okay, you don't have to call. But you're probably going to wind up the restaurant by yourself a whole lot more if you don't. So, so if that's the case, maybe, maybe you should call. And frankly, maybe if that's the case, this is not a good person for someone with ADHD, or probably anybody, to really be good friends with. Um, you know, we talked about rebalancing the relationship. Obviously, in couples, we kind of divide tasks based on um, who's good at this does that, and who's good at that does that. And that's how it should be, but there needs to be a balance overall. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you pay half the bills and I pay half the bills, but there needs to be some sort of a balance that we both feel like we're getting what we want in the relationship. Um, sometimes it means changing expectations. To say, and one of the rules is you can't have something done your way and also have it done by somebody else. So the non-ADHD partner, part of their job is to accept the fact that you know what, when she does it, that's just the way it's going to be. I wouldn't do it that way, but you know what, I have too many other things to do and I'm going to let this one go. I'm okay with her doing it if that's how it's going to be because then I'll be happier overall. So it's a matter of taking that the non-ADHD party takes some control over their own happiness in that situation. And sometimes that means just accepting the unchangeable. You know, we come back again to the acceptance part. Um, I should also mention positive attending. Uh, you know, positive attending is an idea from couples therapy of when we're feeling frustrated with our partner, we tend to see the things that they do that annoy us. You know, there it is again, left a glass out or whatever. Um, positive attending is the idea of intentionally looking for the things that the other person does that we like and are happy about. And I think that's an important concept that often gets lost when a couple is struggling. So it's worth saying it and making a point to look for the good things as well. Because there have to be good things or you wouldn't have wound up with this person in the first place. Um, generally, the approach, the basic idea in terms of couples is to try this idea of what I call get back on the same team. 
that often by the time they show up in our office, they don't feel like they're part of the same team. I'm doing what I'm doing, you're doing what you're doing, and we're fighting it out about who's going to do what. And they're not working on problems together, they're working on, they're working in opposition to each other. So part of what we need to do is to get them back to a point of feeling like they're on the same team and they're working together on things. Um, I've mentioned a few different times kind of the value of an apology, how important a good apology can be. However, before you can apologize to somebody else, you have to handle your own reaction to it. That if you're overwhelmed with guilt or frustration or resentment or shame or embarrassment, you can't give a good apology. Because when we're overwhelmed with guilt and shame, we don't see the other person and the effect that this had. Because we're so focused on our own. So first we need to deal with our own reaction, then we can deal with the other person's reaction. But a good apology contains three different parts. First, you have to acknowledge the effect on the other person. I'm really sorry I said whatever it was that I said, um, and uh, you know, I know that was upsetting for you. There needs to be some show of remorse, you need to feel bad about it. And then hopefully a promise to do something better next time, or at least to try. Don't promise what you can't deliver, but a promise of, you know what, I'm really going to try to think before I speak, or to not say, not use those words, or to say it in a better kind of way, or something. So it's a promise to try to make the future better. Emphasis there on try. Um, when it comes to parenting, <clears throat> There's a lot of couples that do pretty good when it's just two adults in the house. And then you add a kid, tired. 